OK. Uh, good evening. This is my final lecture in the series, and. They've all been on time or on infinity. Now. This was actually prompted to me. By a tweet that was made. At the beginning of. October when the Israelis started bombing Gaza. I understand that the person who made the tweet is actually a, a supporter of Israel. But what he said is the overuse of the phrase wrong side of history continues here. And else, despite the obvious evidence in front of our eyes that history is in no sense an unstoppable arc towards greater moral progress. Now, I'm not going to argue about moral progress. But. I'm going to argue about. What it means. For history and indeed for time to have a direction. Because. It's not obvious that history has a direction. And surprisingly, it's not obvious that time has a direction. And I'm going to look at this at three levels. At the level of natural philosophy. From Newton onwards. At the level of. Biology and chemistry bringing in. Very recent research work from my own university, Glasgow. Um, the stuff that's been published in nature within the last two or three months. And then I'm going to be talking about. The idea of historical progress in historical materialism. So why does time have a direction or does it have a direction? It's obvious to us that clock time moves on and our notion of time is heavily influenced by looking at clocks. And if if we start off at um, 10 past 11 on my kitchen clock here. 45 minutes later, it's saying 5 to 12. And time has moved in a definite direction. It's moved clockwise, as we say. There's a direction of rotation that we take to be the clockwise direction. And there's a reason for that, why, why we have that direction. But that's how we think of time as moving because of our experience of clocks. But if you look in the mirror, clocks run in reverse. At 10 past 11, the clock looks like this. And at 5 to 12, it looks like this. So the hands have moved in the opposite direction. This hand has moved round to there to get to 11. But th does time move backwards in mirror land? Is the forward direction of time just a matter of whether or not you look in a mirror? Let's take another example. In Perth, Scotland, not so far from where I am, the sun rises to my left and sets to my right. So the sun moves in a what we call a clockwise direction. And we call it clockwise direction because clocks were invented to mimic the action of the sun and more specifically to mimic the action of a sundial. Now, here's a sundial showing one o'clock. As the sun moves in a clockwise direction above it, the shadow moves in a clockwise direction below. So our notion of clockwise and our notion of time being a rotation comes from this experience of the way the sun moves. But if we move to Perth, Australia, 
the sun rises on my right and sets to my left. And sundials, Australian sundials, move anti-clockwise. It's not so easy to see here, but here's an Australian sundial uh, set to point to the south. And as the day moves, the shadow is going to move from three o'clock to four o'clock, moving in an anti-clockwise direction. Reverse direction. But time doesn't move backwards in Australia. It's just a change in perspective. The direction of rotation of the Earth hasn't changed. We've just moved from one side of the equator to the other. The equivalent to looking at something in the mirror. But what if we take the rotation of the planets, which in conventional conception move anti-clockwise around the sun. That is to say, if we look down on the solar system from the direction of the pole star, the planets are moving anti-clockwise. But what if we reverse the rotation of all the, the planets on their axis? performed a mirror imaging operation and got a mirror system, what would happen then? Well, the sun would seem to rise in the east. The phases of the moon would go into reverse. The whole calendar would run backwards. Eclipses that happened last year would happen next year by our perception in that sense since everything is now moving in the reverse direction, the calendar would unwind. All the events measured by our calendar, and our calendar is fundamentally tied to the position of the, um, the bodies in the sky, the apparent position of the bodies in the sky. Everything would move in reverse. Why is this? It's because our laws of motion or Newton's laws of motion work equally well in mirror image. Or what amounts to the same thing. If you reverse the time axis, express time in the negative direction, everything still works. So in Newtonian mechanics, there's no arrow of time. Whether time runs forward or backwards is immaterial. Now, in the 19th century, Newtonian mechanics was supplemented by statistical mechanics. At the micro level, if you read Boltzmann, his statistical mechanics is still Newtonian. It's still about atoms moving and bouncing off one another. But he was able to introduce a, an arrow of time due to increasing entropy. And this is the normal account you'll get now of why there's an arrow of time. Why does entropy tend to increase? Well, entropy is a logarithmic measure of probability. And what the tendency of entropy to increase means is that things will evolve towards more probable states. And that's inherent in what probability means. If something is in an improbable state, it's less likely to stay in an improbable state. Now, let's take an example. Suppose we had a cylindrical chamber, say the inside of an aircraft cabin, uh, that you had vacuum on one side and air in the other, and they're separated by a, a polythene membrane. This is the type of setup that was used in the 1950s to see what the effect of sudden decompression would be. The sort of thing that happened when that 
airliner window blew out two days ago. Suppose you puncture the, the membrane, puncture it with a knife. The membrane splits and air rushes into the half of the vacuum. Can you hear me again? So I'm assuming it's working again. Um, the, the air rushes in. That's because the initial situation was improbable and this situation moves to the more probable state where the air is equally distributed. And that's an extreme example. But it's the, an example on which all our internal combustion engines and similar devices depend. Now, as I said, Boltzmann's statistical mechanics is still deterministic. The individual atoms follow deterministic conservation laws. They conserve mass, momentum and energy. All of these are conserved in all interactions. And what he was able to do was to leverage probability theory to show that even if you start off with symmetrical laws, time symmetrical laws of mechanics, you can end up with a tendency for entropy to increase and things to have a direction of time. Now, if we take this fact that everything at the micro level is deterministic, it means we can model an experiment with this passage of time using other determinants. And the determinant system I'm going to be talking about are lattice gas models, which are simplified models of gas, um, where you're modeling the processes in the gas by purely micromechanical means. The, the machine shown here is a lattice gas machine that I designed about 20 years ago. It was for modeling two dimensional gases with each locality of the gas modeled by a state machine that evolved by Boolean logic. Each of these chips was capable of modeling a thousand locations. And in each direction, 32 wires moved to the neighboring chip or 32 wires, the chip above. So altogether, I could model 16,000 locations in the gas in that array. And I could model the movements of the atoms by movements of bits following Boolean logic. Now, if we take the example that I just gave of a cylinder with all the gas on one side, all, all the molecules on one side and nothing on the other side, uh, you can see the direction. If, if the picture's clear enough, you can see the direction the molecules are all moving. Starting out in a highly ordered state, where half of the molecules are moving to the right, and half of the molecules are moving downwards. And this is um, a rectangular lattice gas. You can get hexagonal lattice gases. If we run it for uh, n steps, I can't remember what n is, you end up with the molecules randomly distributed. Just as a real gas would spread equally throughout the volume. In fact, it was sufficiently good that we could pass sound waves through this gas. We could model a loudspeaker at one end and a microphone at the other, and we could pick up the sound going through it. Because the, the hardware was so fast, we had to run it about um, a thousand times slower than the hardware was designed for, but you could do it. The atoms have gone through the gas and the entropy has increased. This is apparently a more probable state. 
as predicted by the entropic arrow of time. On the other hand, since our machine is deterministic, and since it's programmable, we can reverse the momentum of every molecule. And after n steps, we return to the original configuration. Now this appear this was seen as a fundamental problem in um, Boltzmann's conception, because although he had shown time move forward under some circumstances, it was pointed out that time could move backwards equally well. And why is that? It's because although this appears to be a random state, this state of the exact position of all those molecules isn't random at all. It's the state which originated in that ordered state, from that ordered state. And since the micro laws of motion of atoms are deterministic, it encodes its original starting state. And if we reverse it, it goes back. So the increase in entropy is only an apparent increase. It still encodes the original position in that particular case. On the other hand, there's a vast number of possible random distributions of the molecules, which won't, when reversed, end up with the gas all on one side. So in terms of probability theory being counts of things, this is a very small sample. Most random positions are incapable of being reversed. So in a sense, the paradox of times directionality is still there. Um, Maxwell didn't really solve it. 